University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Today's keynote panel on the future of markets is moderated by Ray Suarez, the senior correspondent for the NewsHour on PBS and graduate of the University of Chicago's Master of Arts program in the social sciences. Please welcome one of America's most respected journalists, Ray Suarez. I'm sitting on the edge of my chair in heart because I can't wait to get the panel started, but also because these chairs don't flatter short people. <laughs> um, even though I'm not an economist, nor do I play one on TV, uh, it's such an important topic that I was uh, able, uh, very glad to, uh, to, be a, to get to Chicago to help run this conversation. Uh, a few months ago, I met Nouriel Roubini, um, a chipper, as you know, a very chipper, upbeat guy. And uh, we talked about black swans, of all things. And, of course, as you know, that's the idea that uh, there were certain things that you would never see. But this was before I started to see things that I never thought I would see. The chairman of GM, uh, moving on to, as we say in Washington, spend more time with his family, uh, not on his own, but at the suggestion, the insistence of elected officials. When arms of the federal government own 80% of AIG, when Chrysler is brokering a shotgun marriage with Fiat, which was considered one of the weaker players in the world auto market not all that long ago, um, not at the suggestion, but again at the insistence of elected officials. And this shotgun marriage has to be consummated by a date certain. So the questions about the futures of markets aren't some airy-fairy abstract conversation that we can then print in pamphlets and file away somewhere at the Booth School. This is really cutting-edge stuff. And it's going to have a lot to say about what kind of world you do your business in and what kind of world the rest of us live in for the next two, five, ten, and twenty years. As governments in much of the world might be pushed to insist on greater market intervention as a result of political conditions on the ground, and governments that have, in the um, momentum of the last 10 and 20 years, been moving out of government intervention as a habit, uh, might slow their migration to, uh, to a lighter hand on the economic tiller. So big things are happening in the world as a result of what's being popularly called the meltdown. And when you're going to talk about big things and you're going to have a panel discussion to do it, it helps to have this particular panel sitting in the comfy chairs. From, I guess, my right but your left, these are just spatial designations, I assure you. Um, <laughs> Let me introduce the panel. Gary Becker is University Professor of Economics and Sociology and the 1992 Nobel Prize winner for Economics. Gary, along with Kevin Murphy and Stephen Levitt, established the Becker Center on Chicago Price Theory, which emphasizes the fundamental role of markets in understanding and improving modern life. Raghuram Rajan is Gleacher Distinguished Service Professor of Finance former chief economist at the IMF. His research focus is economic growth and the role finance plays in it. He won the inaugural Fisher Black Prize in 2003 for his contributions to the theory and practice of finance. Kevin Murphy is the Stigler Distinguished Service Professor of Economics, the John Bates Clark Medalist and recipient of a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. That's why he gets to wear a baseball hat on the panel 
<laughs> while the rest of us have to wear neckties. He focuses on the empirical analysis of inequality, unemployment, and relative wages, along with the economics of growth and development, and the economic value of improvements in health and longevity. Steve Kaplan is the Neubauer Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance, also the faculty director of the Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship. Business Week named him one of 12 top business school teachers in the country, and his class, Developing a New Venture, has become a premier business plan competition and incubator. Marianne Bertrand is the Steingraber Professor of Economics. As an applied microeconomist, she's published widely on topics such as racial discrimination, CEO pay and incentives, and the effects of regulation on employment. She's the recipient of the 2004 Elaine Bennett Research Prize for Outstanding Economic Research. And Anil Kashyap is the Brown Professor of Economics and Finance and is an expert on banking, corporate finance, and monetary policy. In addition to teaching and extensive research, he currently works as a consultant for the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago and is one of two faculty directors of Chicago Booth's Initiative on Global Markets. So uh, I'm sure you agree we've got some terrific horses pulling this cart over the hill. Gary Becker, uh, we spoke last night, and you declared yourself, over some terrific Chinese food, an optimist. But I think um, beyond that simple declaration, you have to make a case for optimism. Why and why now? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and participate in this panel. I'm a qualified optimist, Let me, and I'm going to stress both the optimism and the qualifications of my optimism. My optimism stems from my belief that if you look at the world as a whole, the importance of markets, and we're, we're speaking about the future of markets, is not being lost on China, on India, on Brazil, even on Russia. Uh, you see very little, as I see very little, deviation from the belief that the way to obtain economic progress for these countries to catch up to the rich countries is mainly, not entirely, mainly rely on markets. That's, that's one source of my optimism. My second source of optimism is there's a great respect for the importance of human capital, for education and other forms of human capital worldwide. If you look at, we're not allowed to have any, uh, any charts here that we, we're putting up, so I'm not going to put up any charts, but if you look at the data, on higher education, for example, in the world. There's been an enormous increase in poorer countries as well as rich countries in the emphasis given to higher education, especially for women, let me add, and I've been speaking to some of the uh, female attendees here, but it's also true for men. Uh, uh, women now in the richer countries have mo are more likely to have a college education than men, not only in the United States but elsewhere, but everywhere there's a great increase in the importance of, of education. The third force, I'll just mention briefly, because some of the other panelists will speak more about it, is the recognition that world trade is, is a major vehicle for poor countries to attain the level of well-being, material and other well-being that the richer countries have, including longer life expectancy. So that's my optimism. Now, where do the qualifications come from? There is a battle, I think, going on now, not between central planning and markets. The central plan has lost that battle. Uh, but it's a battle between two different visions of capitalism, what's called the Anglo-Saxon vision, Great Britain and the United States, where you, have, you mainly rely on competition to regulate. Of course, there's government regulation, and, and there should be. But you mainly rely on competition to regulate. You have flexible labor markets. Uh, companies have to make it or not make it on their own, and they don't get government assistance. The alternative to that is what's called sometimes the French model of capitalism. It's also capitalism, but it's a government-directed form of capitalism, where the government protects individual companies, tries to reduce competition, particularly from foreign companies. It protects laborers and labor market, protects jobs rather than competition in labor markets. So those are the two visions. Now, if you look at where the world, the U.S. in particular, is going and, and where other countries are going, 
There's a movement in the U.S. now, and this is part of my qualified optimism, I'm much less optimistic about that, toward aspects of the French model. And I'll just give very quickly three examples of that. The automobile sector. You mentioned AIG. The, the data today in the, uh, in the Wall Street Journal show that the U.S. government will be owning 72% of GM. Now, can you imagine that? GM, once the greatest American company, is now a government company. The other 17% of it is owned by the unions. So 10% is, is left for everybody else. Um, we should have let GM and other companies go into bankruptcy seven months ago. I was arguing that at the time, as was other people. But instead, we've had the French version of it. We, we, government activity trying to support the industry. And we're going to put at least $100 billion into the automobile industry. That's like $300,000 per automobile worker, UAW worker. I mean, it's amazing. But that's one problem. A second problem is the proposals to go in the European model toward unionization in the United States. We attribute much of the automobile's trouble in the United States, not all of it, management has a lot to blame, but much of it to the unions, UAW in particular. Instead, the proposals are to spread the importance of unions. We attribute much of the difficulties in K-12 to education in the United States to the hostility of the teachers' unions to various forms of reform. So if you look at two of the prominent unions in the United States, they're hardly an example why we should be moving in the direction of greater unionization. But that other proposal at the moment. The third proposal, very quickly, is antitrust policy. The U.S. has moved an antitrust policy away from the view that what you try to do in antitrust policy is protect competitors toward a view that you promote consumers' interests. The European vision is still that you protect competitors. They've gone after Microsoft. They've gone after Intel. They've gone after GE. Not surprisingly, all American companies, all, the, all three companies, because, with the purpose of protecting co competitors from strong competition. And that is the proposals being made now in the United States. Now, if you look at the data, and that's my last comment, if you look at the data on performance, since 1990, I put together some data for France, the U.S., and Great Britain. I mean, there's a lot of other data that one could mention, but these, everybody will agree these are important statistics. You look at the growth in GDP per capita, 1.4% in France from 1990 to 2007. I'll come to the later years in a moment. 1.9% in the, in the U.S. and about 1.9% in Great Britain. So an enormous difference. Uh, one half of a percentage point over 20 years makes an enormous difference in per capita income, particularly if it continues even further. If you look at employment growth, 0.07 in France, 1.1% in the U.S., 0.4% in Britain. So U.S. is certainly, uh, France is somewhere between Great Britain and the U.S. Unemployment, a very important statistic. It averaged over that period of time in France about 11%. It averaged about 5% in the U.S., about six, a little over 6% in Great Britain. Again, an enormous difference. Look at youth unemployment. This is where young people are getting into the labor market, where their opportunities are formed. It's averaged 23% in France, 11.5% in the U.S., 12% in Britain, about half. You look at Muslim unemployment. Important minority in France. They were rioting a few years ago. The estimates are, nobody knows for sure, it's about 40% unemployment in, in France. They're alienated from the economy. In the U.S., the Muslims more or less have been integrated into the, the U.S. economy. Now, what about recent years? Well, people will say, well, France has managed during this, these bad times, this financial crisis, to adjust better than the U.S. and Great Britain. Well, it's about the same as Great Britain. The estimates from 19, 2008 to 2010 is that French GDP per capita will fall a little less than 1%, Britain about the same, and the U.S. about three-tenths of a percent on the average over these years. So uh, you, you, you look at either the theory, you look at the data, uh, the belief that somehow the French model of markets is, is better as we go forward in the future than the Anglo-Saxon mo mo model of markets is just inconsistent with the data and I think is a dangerous. That's the reason why I'm only qualified optimistic.
Well, Raghu Ramrajan, uh, you heard Gary Becker open by pointing out that uh, what's often called the BRICS, um, Brazil, Russia, India, China, are not moving away from their conviction that a market-based economy is, uh, is what's going to work in their future. But what about the support of the governed? What about the, um, the Russian on the street, the Indian on the street, or on the farm, more, more uh, accurately? Um, is support at the grassroots going to be maintained when, in the midst of this crisis, those gaudy, eye-popping, year-on-year GDP growth numbers can't be reached anymore? Um, okay, so, so let me start by... by Taking off a little on the on the uh, on what I think uh, led to this crisis, and then come to your your question on on, on support for uh, for governments and growth. Well, to some extent, I think we get overly fixated on uh, on the narrow details of the crisis, the the greed at AIG, the credit default swaps, and things like that. It helps to step back a little bit and think about uh, what sort of big, large forces is this part of. And I think emerging markets, to some extent, play a role in, in how we came about here uh, in the sense that this crisis is a child of past crises. We had crises in the emerging markets in 1998, uh, uh, which, which was really a series of crises over the 1990s, Mexico, for example, in 1994 and so on. And I think at the end of it, uh, emerging markets decided that they were really going to change policies once and for all from uh, relying on, on, on world savings to fuel their consumption and investment, uh, they decided to turn around and essentially become more export-oriented in their growth and, in a sense, not rely on world savings, instead export their savings to the rest of the world. And the, the change across emerging markets is quite dramatic. The number of countries that went from being net importers of savings savings, borrowing from the world to finance the investments, to being net, net surplus countries is, is truly dramatic. There were also industrial countries that expanded the export-oriented growth. Germany is one example. But, but the problem when this happens is that savings have to get absorbed somewhere else. We don't export savings to Mars, so at some point, somebody else in the world has to actually invest more than they save. And it turns out that the Anglo-Saxon economies were typically the ones that took up the slack, and in particular the United States. So the question is, why was the United States, and to some extent Great Britain and Australia, and perhaps countries like Spain, why were they the ones that took up the slack? And this is where you have to ask a little bit more about the political environment under which this is happening. My sense of, of, of what is going on, and obviously one can debate this, is there at least two forces that are going on in why the U.S. is the, the spender of last resort in the world. I think one of those forces is, is, plays into this larger issue which, uh, which both Kevin and uh, Gary have written about, the, the, the skill bias technical change that's happening, the fact that certain segments of society as a result of their greater human capital are making higher incomes, uh, while others, uh, in relative terms and sometimes in absolute terms, uh, seem to be more stagnant. Certainly the high school educated uh, and to some extent even the college educated are falling behind relative to those with second degrees and so on. Now, if you are a worker who sees a stagnant wage, uh, and that's uh, a very, very pr prominent thing that you see every month, uh, how do you actually reconcile yourself to the fact that there is growth going on? My sense is it was tempting uh, for the political establishment to compensate through other sources. And the other sources were, one, asset prices that were rising and uh, a, 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 a tremendous relaxation of credit conditions. So accommodative policies, both monetary, to some extent on the, on the regulation, were important in sort of offsetting this other uh, uh, trend, which could be a source of conflict, the fact that median wages weren't rising, that there, was, uh, pe there were people who didn't have access to higher education, who, who were increasingly getting angry at their situation, and uh, asset prices, rising home prices, were the palliative, so to speak, uh, to offset this, this kind of concern. 
Uh, moreover, the U.S. is special in the sense that relative to Europe, its safety nets are much thinner. Unemployment insurance is not as generous. Health insurance is not universal. And as a result, in the U.S., when unemployment hits 7%, 8%, the politicians really hear it from their constituents. And so the impulse to do something, to do anything, is really strong in this country once unemployment starts hitting, while the impulse in Europe, for example, is not that strong. So to that extent, it seems to me that policies in the United States were far more accommodative in the face of adversity than in other countries, and they were far more supportive to asset price growth uh, and the incentives to push regulators to step in when the growth became excessive was very, very muted. So what we did was we went to some extent from one uh, crisis to another. The 1988 crisis met with huge monetary injection. Went to 2001, huge monetary injection, also fiscal injection. We provided the stimulus to the world. Uh, the U.S. household, through uh, consumption, was providing the stimulus to the world, and the U.S. financial sector was making it possible. Now, the details of how it made it possible are also problematic. The, the incentives in the financial sector, the subprime mortgages being sold to anybody who bought it, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but those are details. The real issue is this was, in some sense, a reaction to a variety of political forces at work. So, at the end of it, we conclude that markets didn't work, while in fact it was also policy which was contributing tremendously to this kind of, of, of situation that we're in. And interestingly, at the end of this, uh, we, 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 we had this grand bargain of extremely accommodative policy and rising asset prices, which led to the de debt fuel consumption uh, and expanded credit. Things are broken down. When things broke do uh, break down, Clearly, a lot of the blame belongs to the private sector, but we don't turn around and blame the regulators. Uh, to, you know, for the most part, we are actually putting far more power in the hands of the regulators. And I think this is where I will, I, 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 I will end. My, my pessimism comes from the fact that now uh, we, we, we essentially um, are not asking questions uh, of the government and its role in, in, in what happened. There's a loss of faith in markets. We are going to regulate, but when we regulate, we're going to find that the same old forces that were responsible for the move up will, will actually get more power in this process. Uh, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is uh, my colleague Luigi Zingales and I wrote a book uh, called Saving Capitalism from the Capitalists. Uh, the argument there was that too many governments, uh, too many countries had, uh, had, uh, had regulation captured by the incumbents, and the good thing that had been happening in the global economy was that global trade, global finance had reduced the power of individual governments and was making it possible for greater growth to happen. I think if I were to write that book today, I would revise it somewhat to say that global finance, to some extent, has also been driven by the, glo uh, by, by the political forces at work. And with this reaction that we have today, with this reaction against markets, we will find that the political forces will mold global finance again in a way which will probably be, uh, uh, be, uh, be, be, be something detrimental for the future. That is something we have to w watch out for. So the concerns that Gary pointed out, uh, I, would, uh, I, I would push forward on that. For example, we know that if we are to deal with these problems, we have to create more opportunity for the larger masses. We can't let finance provide that opportunity in a way that is, that is fake, that is not real. We can't let asset price booms be the way that you, you satisfy people who are falling behind. You need to provide them the ability to compete in a world economy, which means better education, which means better health care. Those are the things we want to focus on. Certainly, the Obama administration has the right plans in terms of broad directions. But unfortunately, when you start remaking the whole economy, the details matter. And in the details, we are probably likely to falter. For example, take energy policy. For most economists, the right way to deal with energy is to impose a carbon tax. That will create the right incentives to innovate and to get around this. 
Instead, we have this cap and trade system where 85% of the permits are going to be obtained by incumbents, which is, uh, is then going to create an unlevel playing field for those sectors that come in later, for those uh, industries, that, th those, those entrants who want to come in down the line. Similarly, we're going to get financial regulation. But a lot of the financial regulation is going to be shaped by the incumbents and is going to be problematic in terms of entry and competition down the line. So the, the, the truth is we need to change the way things are somewhat, in my view. We need to create more opportunity. We need to create more enterprise. But in the process of recreating this whole thing, we're doing it in an environment where there's tremendous suspicion of markets. And so what we'll end up with, in my view, if we, if we go down this route, is, is probably regulation that we'll all repent down the line. Kevin Murphy, what about that, um, that environment of suspicion of markets? Uh, does, know, the, does, that, does that move like a business cycle moves and, and ebb and flow, wax and wane? Or are there things that happen that sort of have a, a 10 or 20 year tail so we might be looking at a, a, a re-regulation of a deregulating economy? I think it's probably too early to tell. I mean, certainly the direction is the one that Gary and, and Raghu laid out, that we seem to be headed for uh, more, and this is in the U.S. I think that is distinct somewhat from the world. There's some retrograde motion in the world as a whole, but the U.S. definitely is probably the one that I'm the most concerned about, and I'll try to explain why a little bit. Um, you know, but I, I think the thing to always remember when you think about economies is, you know, and it's tough right now because the, the crisis and the, re and, the, and the recession is on everybody's mind. But, you know, your bread is really buttered by growth. That is, long-term growth and the ability to increase living standards over time is really the dominant economic force. You know, I would, I would like to have presented a chart today if you, you sort of graph real GDP in the United States from the 80, you know, 1880 to today, you know, it looks basically like a line, and you can see the Great Depression, but even the Great Depression relative to that enormous progress doesn't look so big, and to the recent downturn, it, it looks relatively small on that chart. And what really worries me is that the kinds of changes that have been talked about, re-regulation, tighter antitrust policy, limits on compensation, they run the risk of slowing down that that long-run engine of growth, and it doesn't take much to uh, to really cause long-term harm, and, and that that's my biggest uh, concern. When you think about growth, you know, business cycles are tough. We don't really, as economists, completely understand business cycles, but growth is something we do understand. There's really four ingredients that go into making countries richer. One is investment in physical capital, that is, giving people, giving workers more tools to work with. Number two. Investment in human capital, giving workers more skills to use in their production. Number three is innovation and technical change. That is improving the technology that people have to work with. And as Raghu mentioned, those two go together because as we get technical change, it's hard to use the new technology if you don't have more human capital to go with it. And if you don't get the investment to put that in place, that is the physical capital side, it's also hard to take advantage of technical change. And finally, number four is the coordination or the organization of production, that is getting those resources put together. One of the biggest forces for worldwide growth is the reallocation of resources across countries. We constantly hear in this country, well, we're moving jobs here, we're moving jobs there. But the movement of capital and know-how to places around the world where we can improve the productivity of workers in other places is you know, an enormous engine of growth for the world as a whole. We can take resources that are undervalued, underutilized today, and put them to better use. And what worries me here is that we're going to reduce the incentives to make those investments, reduce the incentives to, to, to invest in physical capital, tax people to the point where human capital investment becomes less attractive. The most startling fact to me is that today the return to a higher education is double what it was in 1980. The reward to getting human capital increase is tremendous. The biggest obstacle we have right now in the United States is a failing K-12 system that fails to prepare people to go to college. When the return to college went up, people went on to college, 
but too few people were successful. To me, that's a concern. I don't see us addressing that issue. You see, you know, one of the issues, we have to remake General Motors. Who in their right mind would put the government in charge of that task? <laughs> it's just... Uh, of all the things that government can't do, that's got to be near the top of the list, okay? It just makes no sense, okay? This gets back to the idea of innovation. Where has the U.S. really been a leader? Gary talked about, you know, growth in the U.S. Where have they been a leader? They've been a leader in IT. They've been a leader in medical innovation. They've been a leader in financial markets. They've been a leader in, in higher education. And those are all interlinked. They all go together. It's not a coincidence that, you know, Intel, Microsoft, all those companies, both through antitrust policy, also through financial markets, through interlinks with higher education in the United States, were successful. That's improved U.S. growth. If we reduce incentives here, the innovation that we've had in the U.S. above and beyond what's happened in other countries is likely to slow. Who's that going to hurt? That's not just going to hurt the U.S., in fact, the people it's going to hurt the most is the rest of the world. The rest of the world has benefited tremendously. Think about the medical area. If you're in the pharmaceutical business, the medical device business, the U.S. market is the driver for what you do. And that innovation benefits not just people in the U.S., but people worldwide. Give you a rough idea. Improvements in life expectancy in the United States alone add about $3 trillion in present value every year. You slow that down 10%, it's $300 billion a year lost. Just a little slow of progress in the medical area. Technological progress as a whole adds about the same amount over again. We reduce incentives to increase human capital, to increase innovation, just a little bit. And those are the losses to the U.S. alone. So my biggest concern here is that in the face of crisis, we're going to adopt long-run policies that are not going to kill growth in the long run, but the thing we have to remember, slowing it in the long run is potentially very costly. And I really hope that we can avoid that, that we can continue to remember that while markets can cause short-run fluctuations, they're far and away the best tool we have for providing long-run growth for the United States and long-run growth for the world as a whole. And the rest of the world has an interest in us getting it right, not just ourselves. Very briefly before I move on to Steve Kaplan. So when President Obama says that he is very much interested in making the government's foray into the auto business very short-lived and that he has no interest in making this just the way things are, as it is in many other countries, do you not believe him? I think it's going to be hard to get him get out in any reason in any useful way. I and think. I think a good example of that is TARP. Right, TARP was you know the government was going to put in money into the banks and then the banks were supposed to repay it. And what happened? The banks are coming. We we really want to repay it now. And what is? But maybe for what, other reasons. Which, well, but they want we'll they, they want to repay it for good reasons. But um, the government is saying, oh, hold, hold on a second, we 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 don't want you to pay it back, and that's I think, I, the worry. I, the government has put a hundred billion. I think they'll end up putting at least a hundred billion into the automobile company. It's going to be very hard for them to get out of that industry because it's going to be very hard for them to get that hundred billion back. I mean, it, to believe that the government is going to re-engineer, as Kevin said, re-engineer GM and Chrysler, uh, for and we'll see, we'll see, <laughs> re-engineer them. They can be successful, and they create a lot of value for these companies. I mean, it, it, it's you just can't. I mean, it's just un not credible that they'll be able what, to do that. But I, 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 before we get bogged down, and we'll come back to autos because I think it's a, a very good illustrative case. Uh, of what we're talking about, and, and obviously uh, something that, uh, that piques the interest in, on the panel. Um, let's, <laughs> let's turn to uh, human capital. Does the crisis, not only in the United States, but in the rest of the world, uh, slow down a trend toward more efficient use of human capital? And you're talking to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, That's not the question. The, the, um, the answer is, I think, certainly. And there are some 
real, I guess, troubling uh, issues that we've seen, particularly with the financial companies. And this is where the government went in, put the money into the banks. Uh, some of the banks didn't really want it. Uh, they took it anyway because uh, they were told they had to. And then three months later, when the Obama administration and the new Congress came in, uh, they were slapped with new compensation restrictions that uh, were retroactive. And it was not what they had uh, bargained for. It was not part of the agreement, but you know, it was done. And in you know what that does to the financial institutions, it wrecks havoc. And you know there are people in this room who uh, have been hurt by it. There are people in this room who've benefited from it. You see, uh, talent moving from uh, the banks that have taken TARP are moving elsewhere. You see people moving from AIG because of the uh, compensation uh, restrictions and all the hullabaloo over the bonuses. Uh, you see people leaving the Freddie Macs and the Fannie Mae's, and this goes back to the earlier question of GM. Once the government goes in, uh, they have trouble paying people. And if you, you know, this is, will get me in trouble, but if you, if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. And that's, that makes it very hard, uh, makes it very hard to, uh, uh, to improve things if what you, you want to... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it, it makes it very hard to improve things uh, once you go in, and, and that's a real challenge. I think globally, uh, you had this, this entire, um, really the entire system, you had this huge increase in pay for some people, which has gotten a lot of attention. Uh, this increase in inequality that we've seen in the U.S., you've seen uh, everywhere. And where has that come from? This goes back to something Kevin said, skill bias technological change, I think is the, the, the big reason for that in, in all sorts of areas, in you know, CEOs who are the ones who get the most uh, criticism, but you know, money managers, athletes, lawyers, nobody ever complains about the lawyers, but they've seen their pay increase by the same percentage as all these other groups. Wait a minute, did you just say nobody ever complains about lawyers? <laughs> not, I hear not, you right? Not, not, <laughs> they don't complain about them getting paid too much. They complain about everything else they do. So the, this, this increase in pay around the world has happened, and inequality has increased everywhere in the world. And yeah, there's a view of some that it's unfair that people are stealing, and I think the, the reason for it has been that you've had this, this huge boom in technology that allows people uh, who have talent and some luck are able to manage bigger pools of assets or build bigger companies or apply their talent over bigger pieces of the economy. They've gotten wealthier, and that's been viewed as negative by some. What's forgotten in all this is what Gary said at the beginning is that there has been huge benefits to this all over the world. The number of people living above the poverty, poverty level is higher than it's ever been. Life expectancies in every part of the world, except for maybe parts of Africa, have gone up. And they've gone up for all groups. It's not just the, you know, the rich. It's been the, you know, the middle class, the uh, lower incomes have all gone up. And so even though you've had this increase in inequality, which I think is driven by technology, you've seen great benefits around the world, and I think greater benefits in countries where markets have operated. And what is worrisome about what's happening now, particularly in the United States, is that you're going you're gonna to cut some of that back. You're going to retard it by all the different restrictions uh, that we're or that the Obama administration and Congress have been coming up with, you know, every single day. I'm a little surprised that in your answer about human capital and the global labor market, you were talking about uh, restrictions on executive compensation rather than, uh, I don't know, a Turkish high school student going to technical school for two years after he finishes 
or uh, an Estonian woman learning English and German so she can um, translate for the new managers of a company, or, or the human capital addition, the investment in self that's going on all around the world, where those people uh, aren't necessarily seeing their future as tied to the ability of an executive to make $10 million instead of $8 million. But they all benefit. Uh, you can, yeah. well, yeah. Why don't you take that? I just, you, you I just want to say, yeah. I think, Ray, you're, you're, you're right on one front, which is the growth and returns to human capital is not a story of just executive compensation and the super rich and everybody else. There's been an increase in the return to human capital very broadly measured. The gain to a run of, being a run-of-the-mill college graduate versus a run-of-the-mill high school graduate is the thing that's doubled over time. That's not counting CEOs. It's not counting superstar athletes. But, Leave all that aside. But, 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 but we do, have been very, very, very broad. But, but, very broad. But, but we do know, I mean, from all the kind of the great research that has come out on, on the change in income equality, that the, the upper tail has been the main driver of the changes that we observe in the U.S. for the last, you know, 20, okay. 30 years. And, you know, so, so, so and it's just, kind of kind of building what you were saying, Steve. I mean, true. I disagree I with the view that the rest of the world just look like in the U.S. in this regard. The rest of the world does not look like the U.S. The U.S. has had a very kind of different history in terms of the change in income inequality. And, I mean, I, I, mean, I think that, that's a fact. I mean, I think the, da the data is there. And, 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 no, in Europe, yeah, yes, I'm not sure the rest of the world. The main driver of earnings inequality in the, in the United States has been the upper tail. I think the main driver well, is the great these... increase in return to skill levels. And that's by far the much more important component than that. And that is worldwide. That is worldwide. I mean, I mean, virtually studying. every country of the world, the skill differential has, in, has risen for a very good reason. The big problem there, I think, if I may get that in, Marianne, is, you know, in, in, in the U.S. in particular, is why is it we've been unable to get more high school gra uh, students to finish high school and more males in particular to finish college? Because the gains are there, and it's a failing of the educational system. Um, and you can give a lot of culprits to that, to, uh, who, who's responsible that. I mentioned teachers' units, also family structure, a bunch of forces involved in that. But I think the big driver of earnings inequality in most countries has been the general increase in skill differentials, plus some at the upper tail and the increase was, in the earnings just, and so of the top, the top executives. I we'll return to executive compensation because I feel an impulse on the panel to talk a little <laughs> bit more about that as well. Um, this is from a lifelong training as a perceptive person. Um, Marianne, uh, you talk about and you study um, behavior and the way people respond to the, the impulses around them. Uh, and you're finding in your research, as I understand it, that people are not as economically rational as economists always concern, uh, uh, assume. So market outcomes are not always so sensible. Is this an opening for governments to uh, at least be players in the regulation of the operation of markets? I mean, certainly some of my research, a lot of other people's research has been in a direction of documenting that people have, you know, seem to be making systematic, systematic mistakes when they, make, when they make decisions, especially if you focus on those rare those decisions that are not very common, that are complex, say, you know, choosing a mortgage for, for a home or buying, you know, buying insurance. And I think there's, you know, as I said, more and more kind of documentation that these mistakes take place, that they are systematic, and maybe not so much kind of research kind of establishing that, you know, kind of empirically that, you know, kind of markets cannot undo that. But I think theoretically, I think there's a, a beginning of a literature that kind of seems to suggest that what, you know, where a typical answer would be, well, if a firm tried to, you know, kind of exploit consumers' myopia, for example, their inability to think about how much the printer in cartridges will cost when they buy the printer, that, you know, a computer will come in and will try to undo those mistakes. I think the, the theory that's coming out seems to be suggesting that maybe this will not happen. Maybe that, you know, competition will not work to actually undo um, kind of, you know, from sensation sometimes to kind of uh, exploit, uh, exploit those biases. So I don't know what that means, kind of room for, uh, for government intervention. I think that means, in my mind, you know, kind of room for thinking harder about making choices that are sometimes difficult for people easier. So I believe strongly that, you know, we should think harder about information disclosure. We should think harder about helping people when they face complex choices. They're looking at different kind of like credit cards where there are long foot, you know, big footnotes and very small fonts. 
uh, different kind of parameters that enter in the price function, they can't compare those things, that we should not believe that somewhere, somehow, these people figure out what's good, uh, what's good for them. And that we need to kind of think about helping people, you know, compare, simplify things, because it does not seem to be happening um, in the markets. But if you really believe in the, the movement of markets as sort of the, the expressed will, the sort of aggregated movement that's created by thousands and thousands of individual choices, how can you even say that they're mistakes? They are the outcome of people's choices. They are what people choose. And we see in the aggregate their effect, but well, you know, that's life. <laughs> Again, so I mean, an example that's on top of my mind, if you think about obesity, I mean, there's a big obesity crisis in this country, one could say, and if, you know, you know, there are certainly kind of you know, strong advocates for the view that obesity is a choice. I know. <laughs> I was going to say advocates over here that obesity is a choice. On the, on, on the other hand, we also see these people that become, you know, that become hobbies to spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on trying to get these obese. Um, you know, that tells me something about the fact that he might have been, you know, might not have been as strong of a choice. That's just one, of, you know, one example. Uh, no, come on, I don't think so. I think the big issue, um, if I may interject one, one quick remark. I, I mean, I agree with Marianne that, you know, the, the individuals make mistakes. There's no question about it. And they're systematic and they're often hard to correct. The big issue, however, when one considers government policy is how efficient will the government be at correcting these mistakes? Because so the same individuals are making these mistakes in the private. I didn't say you said I, that, I know, but I think that's an important issue to get out in front. The same individuals who are making these mistakes in the private sector are the individuals in the government sector. And they lack the forces of competition that help not eliminate these mistakes in the private sector, but to modify them. And I think that's a, a crucial difference in asking about what public policy should be as a result of observing that. We know that people but, make a bunch of mistakes. Yeah. But if we do isolate situations where the force of competitions don't seem to get us to converge towards, you know, kind of getting, you know, people de-biased, if you want to speak this way, yeah. then, then we're back to thinking, I totally agree with you that, you know, uh, you know governments, there are inefficiencies in government. I've done lots of research kind of showing that in, you know, many different contexts. But then it becomes kind of a more philosophical discussion that we cannot trust the government to actually, you know, kind of do any better and they should just keep things as they are, even, they're, even, even if they're not per perfect. My, my opinion to be, would be to be more, well, you know, let's try to get the governments or let's try to kind of get them to do something as well as possible. Well, let's, let's, I, I like your example. You, you touched briefly on mortgages. And as we've learned to our dismay in the past year as a country, there were an awful lot of people taking out an awful lot of mortgages that if you took... 10 minutes to read the terms, you would have said, uh-oh, this seems like a bad idea. Is there a role for a government to stand in between you and the mortgage broker and give you that uh-oh moment uh, so you might not take a mortgage that's going to blow up in your face in 18 months? Marianne? Oh. <laughs> so, 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 so the worst for a Neo. I mean, I, I think... It's actually interesting, guys. There's one study I saw recently that's, you know, suggesting kind of, say, more counseling. I don't, I don't, I don't know whether I believe that, but that's one study that came out of actually Illinois where they actually look at the choices that people made for their mortgage uh, when there was some counseling taking place. It seems, I haven't read the details, but the, the, the findings were in the direction of people made better choices. But there's evidence from Europe. Like, for example, I read about Germany. And in Germany, it seems that you need to have in the room when you make choices like a notary that will help you at least the time when you start signing documents, kind of make sure that you understood all the, all the small prints. These models, you know, exist other places. I don't know why we cannot kind of consider them. The U.S. The government was encouraging people to, to take out those mortgages. Let me go back to something Rachel those just said. Those mortgages that you find, and I find, you know, very questionable, the government was encouraging those right, mortgages. Right, exactly. And, and, you know, if you, had, if you just stop, I mean, what's happened now, those mortgages are really hard to get. The markets would have reacted. What happened there is the government was telling the banks to, and Fannie and Freddie, we want a large fraction of your mortgages to go to people who can't afford them. That was the law. You know, and so that got implemented. That law, I think, I don't know if that law has changed. It should. Yeah. And then what you also had is you had the people at the top didn't quite understand what was going on with these liar mortgages, with all the shenanigans that were going on. They just got it wrong. Now that they understand, oh my God, these incentives were there. They were bad incentives. There were all these bad things happening. 
they've been changed. They won't make that mistake again. Now, they'll make some other mistake. I don't know what it's going to be, but that's what markets do. They, if you make a mistake, and markets do make mistakes, but they're self-correcting, and the government, I think, too many times goes in and you know, makes the correction after it's necessary and then causes, you know, has unintended consequences going forward. Anil Kasha, you're going to run the anchor leg on our terrific first round relay uh, because we've got the fundamentals of the market and human capital still in place and we've got uh, markets imperfect as they sometimes are and uh, but self-correcting as they inevitably are. Uh, public policy that isn't always a friend to innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, where does that leave us with respect to the current situation and the banking and finance industry that has to have the right body English to get us through this month and next month, but also next year and the next decade? Uh, okay, so let me make one point just on this markets and the government. I think there's a lot of room to improve disclosure that would protect consumers because a lot of disclosure is done to benefit the suppliers of the products. And that's because there's political economy uh, problems whereby the incumbents capture the regulators and allow disclosure to be 37 pages of, you know, six-point font. And I don't think markets are ever going to correct that because I think the political economy works against it. And I think that's a case where if you change the expectation for how the consumer protection should work so that it should be simpler and aimed and designed to benefit the consumers instead of the incumbents, I think all free market people can generally embrace that. Um, in terms of the the near term, I guess I'm a macroeconomist, so I actually think I know something about the business cycle. Uh, I thought and nobody, I, nobody did. Well, I, I, I think it's going to get worse. So I, the thing I'm very worried about is Kevin had us imagining this graph for 120 years of, of U.S. progress where the Great Depression looks like a little valley that, that then disappears. The alternative is Japan where you graph the data and you can see a kink. All you have to do is just graph GDP in Japan around 1990, something changed. You don't have to know what it is, but you can have Steve's monkeys looking at it and they'll figure out that something bad happened. And I agree. What, what I'm worried about exactly. for the U.S. is there's a bunch of forces now that, that raise the, the chances of something bad. So here's my like four reasons why the glass is two-thirds empty. Okay? Um, the, the first is, I still think the unemployment rate is going to keep rising through this year, and I think foreclosures will keep rising through this year. They slowed down during the politicized period, but they're going to pick back up. The second is, despite what any of the stress tests say, the banks are long the economy. And when the, when the unemployment rate is rising, when foreclosures are going up, the banks are not going to perform well. And I don't... You can try to make it more complicated about the slope of the yield curve. It's just not going to happen. The banks are going to underperform. You put those two things together, and the banks are not going to be expanding credit. So you're going to have this series of uh, ratcheting down of expectations. I had the governor of the Bank of Canada teach in our class uh, yesterday, and he said the Bank of Canada has cut its forecast for potential growth for this year in half. And I think the U.S. economy is going to be in for a period of slow growth. That brings me to my fourth thing. The government's intervening like crazy in all kinds of directions that we don't really understand. Um, and there's going to be a temptation as things don't speed up to do more, not less. Because I don't think it's very credible that the government caused the, the meltdown I mean, the government aided and abetted it, maybe, but it didn't cause it. And the government's not viewed as, um, as distrustworthy as, as lots of the financial services industry that's going to bear the brunt of this regulation in other parts of the economy. So there's a lot of conditions there that are set to take this and turn it into a kink point. It may not happen for sure, but there's lots of risks. And uh, my favorite example of that is... Um, to get back to the auto industry, 
I've always used the example, we know we're headed towards Japan when? When we prop up Citigroup and order them to lend to GM. Okay. Now, we've cut out the middleman because we have Congress just giving money directly to GMAC to prop up GM and Chrysler and who knows what else. And the temptation, once we're into this, is just going to be keep pouring money into things like that. And then once you've bailed out the auto industry, why not the airlines? Why not whoever else next gets into trouble? The state of California. The state of California. That's, that's the 100-pound gorilla. Uh, so the, the scope to just keep expanding the creep is going to be very much there. Well, GMAC doesn't exist anymore. It's called, felicitously, I think, Ally. Yeah. So um, I don't know how many of you feel that it's your ally. <laughs> but um, those of you associated with this fine institution know the old saw uh, about the University of Chicago where uh, a student will say, uh, well, that's all fine in practice, but how does it work in theory? <laughs> and uh, if, if at the end of this... If at the end of this process, you get an ally that's operable, has a sustainable business model, and um, becomes a responsible corporate citizen, and not on the constant dole, are you still right that it was a bad idea to do it? Absolutely. Well, absolutely. Okay. That, I, Neil and then Ken. I, I, go ahead. Well, you know, first of all, I don't think Neil disagreed very much with what I said at all. I, 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 I think the, the, the one I would disagree with, though, is the rise in the unemployment rate isn't going to cause the kink. The kink is going to cause because you damage the system that generates investment, that generates the pattern of growth that we see. And the, the other things you pointed to are much more likely to do that. And that's the problem here. Being a good citizen is, goes beyond just obeying the rules. It go, innovation is the game here becoming more dynamic, moving to where the new market needs to go. And that's the part that I don't see as happening. If we continue to prop up old institutions, things that are inefficient, that's going to slow the movement of the resources to the more productive things, which is where growth comes from. I just, and I, and I share the fear that Anil has, we're going to turn what could be a temporary downturn into a kink. And, and that's what we're afraid of. That's, that's what the declining growth rates is about. And that's what we have to avoid happening. Go ahead, Bradley. Well, um, so just to, got, uh, just to put a word in for the administration. <laughs> I, guess I, uh, I mean, I really think there are, that there is a political problem building up in the United States as a result of the increasing inequality and now the fact that house prices have fallen so much. There are people who look back at their finances, at their situation, and see they haven't moved in 20 years, right? These are the people who have fueled the Obama wave. Uh, there are a lot, lot many other people who are part of that wave. But uh, he, this is the constituency behind him. Now, there are two ways to go about this. One is to focus on redistribution uh, with the consequences to productivity that Kevin and Gary are, are worried about. The other is to portray a better vision of the future, saying we're going to increase productivity by increasing the capabilities of our workforce, which means better education, better health care, and, and broadly focusing on the sunshine industries. To my mind, that is the argument for the vision that Obama has laid out. These are the things we want to do, education, health care, focus on energy, a sunshine industry. These are good things. And I think then it's a worthwhile vision, but the details matter. And this is where I think you see the disconnect between this panel and, 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 and some of what is being proposed, because, for example, in education, the details are in the K-12, to where unions are a big part of the problem. Unless you tackle them, you're not going to get very far. Throwing money is one thing, but actually getting it to work and to make a difference is a different. Can I say one brief thing? Um, I... I hear again and again how unions are such a big problem and they're the real big problem in K-12, to let me tell you something. If you take the top 10 states in the union with the top 10 sets of results from standardized testing, they are all states whose teachers are organized by the NEA. And if you take the bottom five states in the union with the bottom five sets 
of results on standardized testing. They are all right-to-work states that will not allow the NEA to operate as a collective bargaining representative. So how is it that amidst this terrible, terrible K-12 education, the NEA is such a, uh, an enemy of achievement? When we've got, we've got a, a control group. Mississippi. It's not a well, it's South it's, versus it's, North. It's, uh, it's South Come versus on. North. Oh, oh, it's Mississippi. Come on. Uh, well, how about Arkansas, then? It's okay. not quite as far south. South uh, versus, uh, versus North. If, if you look at the inner city... But there are obviously other externalities yeah. besides... No, the, the, no. no we mentioned the family. We mentioned, I, I mentioned the family. I think the family is important, and the family hits the groups that we would like to see make progress. There's no question about that. So to say the unions are the only group responsible for the poor performance of some parts of the American society is, is, is just wrong. I agree with that. But to say they're not responsible at all, I think that's also wrong. They fought every single effort to get more competition into the K-12. to They fought charter schools all over. They lost in many places, but they fought them. They fought, they fought the vouchers every time they proposed. Every single attempt to get a competitive structure, particularly for the poor children, they fought them. Now, they were beaten on some of the battles, but I don't think you can mention one example where the teachers' union came out and said, I'm going to support this as pro-competitive, I'm going to support this type of educational innovation. And that's what bothers me. Kevin, briefly, and then Marianne, she's yeah, been waiting. Just, I would just say that one of the issues, we've talked a lot about inequality, and we've also talked about education. The, the, the negative effect of our current system isn't uniform. You know, the suburban schools in rich places, public schools work pretty well. It, the failure is, is in the big city schools. It's the inner city. Those are the people who are being failed most by the system. And those are the places where they're the most reticent to any kind of change. They're the least subject to competition. Suburban school districts are subject to competition by people voting with their feet. If, they don't, if the school district isn't good, people are going to move. You know, the inner city schools. So the, you don't want to think of it as a uniform failure, but it's a failure in the areas where we can least afford to fail. But that's the group that, that Raghu's talking about, the group we have to get on their feet. And I think the, the downside to the better solution, which is the supply side solution of getting people more skilled, moving them up the ladder, is it's slow. It takes time. Redistribution is something you can do with a, with a pen. This takes work, and that's what makes me worried. They're going to take the, we're going to take the quick road. I don't want to say they, because I, I think we are going to take the quick road rather than the, the better road, which is to, to aren't, force aren't guys, the supply side. Aren't you guys at all? I mean, Arnie Duncan has a pretty good record on this stuff. I don't, I don't know what the, you know, there's, he's got mixed decisions he's had to take since he's shown up there. But, you know, his, his view inside the Chicago public schools, I think, was pretty impressive. And um, Arnie Duncan had the support of Mayor Daley, who was very, from the beginning of his administration, he said education of the Chicago students is going to be my number one priority. And the combination, they did fight the unions. They made some progress. Absolutely right. If my the president God. does that, I think we'll have, uh, we can have similar progress. But it's going to be very it difficult. The, it seems that was the logic behind the appointment, right? The fact that he saw some progress being made in Chicago and, yeah. you know, kind of an attempt to do that. Uh, I, mean, I know. I just. I mean. I mean. I totally understand this discussion about about GM. And I mean. I guess for me, what's always surprising when I hear the discussion this way, and all the slippery soap argument makes sense, etc. But that it's always kind of as if we can ignore the context. I mean, whenever I think about this decision, guys in in, in DC. I mean, they they don't. You know, we we have a crisis. We have an economy that's extremely weak. And just think about the consequences of letting kind of these big companies go down. I mean, it's you know, it's scary, and that kind of that's where it goes back to, you know, the issue of like a, a lack of a strong safety net, which I strongly believe in. I mean, getting lots of people kind of losing their job when they are kind of no clear, no strong safety net is a scary one. And, and on this, I want to go back to where you know where Gary started. I, I'm not French. I don't want to defend the French. Uh, the French one, actually, I would, I would more like do, do the opposite. But, but, but that's kind of the trade-off that they are facing, right? I mean, okay, we can talk about unemployment. We, we have all form of, you know, underemployment uh, in uh, inner cities. So I think there, there are some kind of similarities there. But I think that in my mind, there's always this trade-off between growth and, you know, kind of minimizing variance. And I feel like a lot of, like, you know, continental Europe economies have decided they wanted to minimize variance. So that's why going with the crisis right now. In France, people don't feel so much. Why? Well, even if they do their job, there's, you know, lots of support out there. They have all these kind of automatic stabilizers that are in the system. 
And, I mean, another way for me to think about that is that we always kind of focus on GDP growth, and obviously that's super important. Another thing people care a lot about is to think about, you know, how would we measure well-being? And there's attempts to do that and compare, you know, across countries. And obviously GDP, GDP growth are strong drivers of well-being. Well, but you, another that. important well, driver yeah. is, you know, feeling, kind of minimizing feeling of insecurity, you know, minimizing, you know, kind of not feeling, you know, kind of inequality is also a driver of well-being. Are These are well, the, the happiness measures. My understanding is the U.S. The happiness absolutely measures absolutely not. Been pretty, the happiest pretty, country they've been pretty constant over time. The happiest time. country in the world is Denmark. But that's 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 a level. I'm talking about the the slope. And the U.S. happiness There's, has not gone down over this period where Ragu <laughs> said people were unhappy and inequality was awful. The, U.S. happiness has been very stable. The happiest countries and, in the world, and it stable. wasn't. A country that, you know, if you take a country like Denmark, for example, I think is maybe between France and the U.S. I mean, it's a country that has managed much more than the French but to reform the labor market, to make the labor market flexible. One comment on the variant, yeah. I did mention that. I agree with you. There are a lot of different statistics one should look at. I mentioned the unemployment. I think that's a really big, of the young, young people, I think that's a big problem. It's a big problem in France. Uh, you had like 25% as the average unemployment over this whole period of time in France before the crisis hit. For the Muslims, it's been 40%. They're not integrated into French society. So if you look at that measure of variance, you know, France has a lot of problems. Now, other measures, yes. Yeah. You look at among the employed people, France has lower inequality than the U.S. has. I Absolutely. Would, I would well, we, we, have, we have subgroups that have horribly high unemployment rates, too, and incarceration yeah. rates. Yeah. and. You could, no, was, no, but a lot no, lower. Thirteen percent was the youth unemployment rate over the last twenty but years. But, but, but again, take a subgroup of the youth. Yeah. How about yeah. well, African American? Take, take African Americans is about eight, fifteen to eighteen percent. Muslims is about forty percent. I mean, again, that, that's a this, huge difference. It goes back to these definition issues, right? I mean, there's well, you know, there's underemployment. I mean, the Muslims rioted there's, there's substantially jail, partly crime. over I mean, that in France. I take. This issue, I, I mean, I, I think I hear Marianne, uh, and certainly I said this uh, also, advocating certain changes to the U.S. system. But whenever you advocate changes to the system, you have to wonder whether the, all the pieces fit together. Uh, and, and I think Gary started off by making this, uh, this point of difference between the Anglo-Saxon and the, the continental system. And, and maybe there are, there are problems in fitting <laughs> one piece from one system into the other. For example... Uh, we have a thin safety net as far as unemployment goes. That certainly puts a lot of pressure once unemployment reaches a high rate, but it also ensures that we don't have high levels of un unemployment for a long period of time. So improving that safety net may be a good thing for a while, but may be a bad thing in the longer term in the sense of increasing unemployment. If you look back historically, uh, the U.S. way of dealing with crises, especially deep crises, has often been temporary changes with our withdrawn. Uh, we, we looked at this when we looked at uh, the crisis in the 19th century. The U.S. didn't have a bankruptcy code, but whenever there was a deep crisis with lots of people in trouble, it introduced a bankruptcy code for a little while, violated the property rights of creditors, and then withdrew the, the bankruptcy code once the crisis was over. So it was temporary adjustments. Uh, the U.S. has not been a great sort of defender of property rights over, over the entire period of history, but it was always sort of flexible to some extent and not permanent changes. So maybe we will get some changes during this crisis. Uh, hopefully, over the longer run, these changes will be withdrawn. That's the, the optimistic view, and we go back to not intervening. We just intervene when a crisis like this happens, which hopefully is once in 50 or 100 years. The pessimistic view is obviously we get into the habit of intervening. I guess that's one of the reasons that worries me about fiscal expansions and spending expansions because I, I, you know, the lessons I think are that that's harder to ratchet back down. And, and I'm, you know, in a world in which it's true we needed to increase the monetary side, and I think the Fed has done pretty well in that regard. I mean, you're a better expert than I am, but I think Fed's been probably the best of the actors in this whole game. But to do at the same time a major fiscal expansion that means we're going to have you know, more spending in the future, more taxes and or more deficits in the future, I, I, to me that's bad timing. I, I don't think we, we needed that. I think that was a bad mix with what we have today. And, and 
the regulatory changes that are coming, which are even harder to reverse. The product liability changes, the labor changes, which, you know, it's a death by a thousand cuts. There, there are various labor changes about the ability to sue, the ability to use union labor, that again, they get put in, they're regulations, and they're very hard to overturn. Antitrust, maybe that moves but around I, the new mileage. I, I do I mean, want to agree with something. Every, every day there's a new regulation, and <laughs> but, almost, and those are very hard to reverse but as I well. Think I a do lot of agree. fiscal expansion started on the Bush. I mean, this is not Absolutely. just, just yeah. the administration. I think um, this, this started... Uh, in the spring of 2008, really. We should put Geithner and, and, and Paulson in the same jail and throw away the keys. But Kevin, but finish your, finish your point, Kevin. No, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, you know, but... Because you were about to agree Yeah, with I was going to agree with Ragu and, 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 and Marianne. I, I think we do need change. And I think that was the message that, of the Obama campaign that I think was right, that there's a lot of areas that do need change. But which, I think... Which ones do you favor? What... What no, no I, I, see, this is the difference. This is what Ragu is saying. It's, 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 you know, it's the method by which you need change. We need to address the growth and inequality. We need to address those issues. The question is, do it in the right way that doesn't slow down the economony in the long term. And, and, and a high school dropout rate is something high school that dropout has to be rate. addressed. It will be hard. Lack of success in college. Uh, and, may, and maybe the Obama administration, certainly they're aware of it. I'm putting more emphasis on it than I think previous administrations. It's not an easy problem, but I think certainly that's a, str a very weak point of the American education well, system. Let, let's talk Every a little bit about, about rising inequality, uh, because I, I find that there are multiple schools on whether that's even a problem. Uh, if in operating markets for labor, for talent, for creativity, you get the wildly uh, different outcomes that you get in various parts of the, the workforce. Um, where is the problem in that? And is that sort of a political problem that has nothing to do with economics, but you still have to correct it, Raghu? So, so uh, I don't think we want to interfere with outcomes uh, to the extent that somebody is very skilled and makes a lot of money, that's good. Uh, so I don't think you want to compress uh, uh, those outcomes and say equality uh, as a result of interfering with outcomes is, is the right thing to do. The problem when you have tremendous levels of inequality, in my view, is you get tremendous scope for differences in opinion on the way to go. You get a very heterogeneous society, which leads increasingly to political conflict about ways forward. Everybody sees things from where they stand, and that creates, uh, you know, difficulty in agreement. You can see it in Latin America, for example, the way tax revenues are spent, the way uh, who's taxed, how much they tax. There's great incentive to fight with each other to some extent. And, and, and so I think the real problem is more a dynamic issue. Uh, and also, the, what leads to the inequality, if what leads to the inequality is, is a great number of people don't have opportunity and aren't able to create value uh, for the society, that, to my mind, is, uh, is a problem for society. And so uh, I, I think thinking about the conditions that lead to inequality and also the political outcomes for inequality, these are the reasons why inequality by itself can hamper our society. Uh, but I don't think the way to fix it is by saying you can't make more money than this amount or we're going to tax the super rich. It's, it's about fixing the underlying conditions. Well, the, the, yeah. equality, well, the U.S. has traditionally been a society that has stressed equality of opportunity with the great imperfections, but that's been the historical emphasis in, in our economy. Uh, and, you, and most Americans will tolerate considerable inequality in outcomes if they feel there's reasonably good inequality of opportunity. Now, uh, and we have reasonably good equality of opportunity, but we have some real uh, defects. And we've been mentioning in, in the education area. That's a, a clear area. You, you're born into a family with a single parent in the inner city. Your chances of achieving are much less than if you're born in another uh, type of family. That's obvious. The challenge is, and I think most Americans would be willing to put considerable resources into trying to fix that problem. 
The challenge is, how do you do it in a reasonably uh, effective way? And that's not such an easy question because, as we said before, it's, it's family structure, it's lack of uh, both parents, it's your peers that you're growing up with, it's the teachers' union, you know, it's the educational system in general. And I think that's where, if, if I was in Washington, fortunately I've never been, but if I was in Washington, um, that's where I would uh, try to put my emphasis. I think that's very important. On the other hand, if I might say one other thing, on the other hand, and Kevin and I were talking about this uh, yesterday when we were driving home from, from a very pleasant dinner. Um, if, you, if you take an immigrant and you ask, where are the chances for an immigrant to succeed greater? In the United States or in, say, Europe or any other place, well, let's say Europe. I think there's no question in my mind that the U.S. provides the best opportunities. Now, my wife is an immigrant to, was an immigrant to the United States. She came to the United States. Several of her brothers went to Europe. They were educated in Europe. They went back to Europe after the Iranian Revolution. They found opportunities really blocked. They moved to the United States. You know, they, they weren't the greatest success, but they did reasonably well. Let's put it that way. They had opportunities. And they, they tested both places and they found, found the difference. So I think uh, we still have a great avenue of opportunity in the United States, but we have ser serious defects. And if we can concentrate on those defects, I think most Americans will say, okay, the outcomes, yeah, there's a lot of inequality. But people have fair chances. If we lock our ability, they, they got different outcomes. So that's where I would put a lot of the emphasis. Marianne, down at the microeconomic level, don't perceptions of opportunity shape the way people invest in themselves? And they don't look at charts and graphs, but they sort of take a gut check on whether it's worth it yeah, no, to, I... to work overtime or take a second job or start a new business. I think, that, I think that's totally true. And I think just to you, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm kind of very concerned about. I think it goes back to the theme that kind of Raghu started and, and Gary was talking about. I mean, I think the thing that's really striking is we have a lot of these kind of surveys can run across countries where people are asked for the level of, like, you know, kind of tolerance for inequality. As you were saying, the U.S. is really has been historically an outlier, I think, you know, kind of, and that's mainly because people believe that, you know, wherever they are, you know, if they work hard enough at it, uh, they can make it to the very top. I think 60% of people would, you know, in the U.S. will answer yes to that question. You go to Europe, that would be more like 30, 40%. You know, what I, what I, what I really fear is that, you know, um, that we are now in a place where people are changing their mind about this. And, you know, obviously, you know, the stories, the media is, is kind of, um, you know, kind of people are latching on those stories, but I think that if people are truly, as, as I fear they are, kind of changing their mind about this, this could be really the beginning of, like, um, the bad kind of regulation some of you here fear. Just to emphasize a point that, that I think might, might be overlooked, uh, I think the opportunity issue becomes especially uh, sort of uh, highlighted when you're talking about skill bias technical change. If, in fact, the road to these opportunities through education. That's something that's very hard to change when you're 35 or 40 years old if you've had a terrible high school education. So it's in that sense that I think with this change, you could see a perception for a large segment of society which has been through the bad schools and through the bad educational systems that they really don't have the opportunities that used to exist earlier. And so I, I think going back to education, it seems to me that's, that's the big issue to fix. Quickly, Kevin. Yeah, I mean, you said 35. It's hard to change when you're 15. I mean, if you're 15 yeah. and you haven't been doing much in school up to that point, it's not so easy to get your life turned around at that point. So, and, and that's the one big obstacle to the education solution. And the big failing we had is this education return has been rising for close to 30 years now. And the interesting thing to me, people talk about perception. If you look at the data, I was one of the early people that worked on inequality and rise in returns to schooling. We started doing that in 1985. You know, when we looked at the data, people started going to college in 1980. They saw it before all the us academics saw it. They saw the rise in returns to schooling, and the market responded, and people responded before we did. We even knew it was there. They knew it before we did. The interesting part, though, is that they couldn't, a lot of people tried, and they weren't successful. The thing that makes me somewhat, you know, the, the most difficult part is if we were to fix the system tomorrow, the fruits of that are years, decades away. And it's a very difficult thing to do. 
and the, the, the failing that we had is that we didn't do it 20 years ago. This is not new news. But what, what are the two, what's the low-hanging fruit that, having studied this all these years, hasn't been picked? Yet, is it anything other than bust up the unions? There's got to be something more that we I think know. more choice. I don't think you have to bust up the unions. I think more choice for people. I what think competition early, early, on the... What about pre-K? Pre-K... But here's the problem with pre-K, okay? Everybody agrees we need more early childhood. Jim Heckman, who's a professor at Chicago, has done a lot of great work on the emphasis on, pre, on pre-K and early childhood. But do we want to, say, take somebody in the inner city who's being failed by K to 12 and put him in a pre-K to 12 system? Is that the answer? Is it starting that system a year earlier that's the solution? Well, there's no perfect, there's no perfect solutions because, I mean, it's a whole overall context. But that doesn't mean there's nothing we, we can be done. I agree. But it's a long-term investment process. But as, human capital is a long-term investment. We're not willing to think long-term. It's going to be impossible to fix the educational I, I, I system. Give you, you, we can wait 20 years to see it because the grandkids will at least see that the, uh, the grandparents will see that the grandkids yeah. are getting better. The thing is, like, what do you do? Well, I think greater competition at the K-12 to is one factor. It's, it's not a magic solution. It's not going to benefit everybody. But, but, again, but the, it, it'll benefit, I think, a significant number of individuals. Uh, but again, I think this is one of these great examples where I totally agree with you that greater competition you know, is important. Yet, you know, people are looking at those environments say, my, my school is failing, now I have the choice to actually go and choose another school. Are finding that parents don't do a good job when they're kind of relocating their kids to the school, the school, they don't do a good job at comparing the options and not picking the best school for that. Which they again means a, that just they do a giving... They don't do a perfect job. Exactly, which is, which but it's back to that, which is back to that. But again, it means that it's more saying that competition will solve it. We need to do the competition, but we also need to understand that people, you know, cannot go through like 200 pages long prospectus and figure out, you yeah. know, what I mean, is if, the best option If you can benefit 10% of the inner school kids who aren't benefiting now, I would, and it, that could be very expensive, but if you could do that, I would say that's a great, really Absolutely. successful Absolutely. program. And I think you have a chance of doing it. But you have to hit on several Absolutely. fronts, Pre, preschool education, greater competition. Absolutely. Um, but, but it, there's some things we can do about the family. I think we're, we, we have encouraged the breakup of families. We can do modest amounts to improve that. But Gary, the other thing we know about the education and skill markets is helping that 10% helps the rest of them. Yeah. Because you reduce the supply of low-skilled people, yeah. that increases job market competition for those individuals right. and raises their wages. Absolutely. One thing is extremely clear from the data, that is supply matters. If you have too few high-skilled people and too many low-skilled people, you're going to get lots of big wage differentials. If you, learn, if you raise the supply of skilled individuals, lower the supply of unskilled, you'll compress that differential. And so you get 10% of the people out of that pool, it helps the 90% who are left, without ever changing their education at all. The problem with the low skill now in the United States is they not only earn less and a lot less, so that's terrible. For that reason and for other reasons, their health is a lot less. So they're bad, they're bad on that. Their employment prospects are a lot less. So they go through periods of unemployment. Their marital prospects are a lot less. So either they don't marry or they, they, have, they have breakups. You take every single dimension of what we consider important in life, and they're far behind. You aggregate all that up. We have a society, and other countries are approaching it, of haves and have-nots. You have a decent education on the average. You're going to do pretty well in all these dimensions. If you don't, you're going to do terribly. And I, I think that's a real problem. Because all that you mentioned, Gary, are things that eventually cost the society money in the average. Absolutely. The, the cost doesn't just accrue to the individual yeah. who, who has bad health outcomes yeah. and, and has a, uh, a marital breakup and thus... Uh, including has, crime. I didn't right, even mention including crime. Including crime. Anil, uh, let's, let's change gears a little bit. Just recently in Washington, uh, following on the Federal Reserve's uh, rolled out new requirements for credit cards uh, last December. Uh, the House and Senate passed Me Too versions of the bill, which even tightened up some of the regulations on credit card issuers. And uh, those will take place um, nine months from the day that the president signed the bill. Credit at all levels, um, whether it's the overnight window for big clearinghouse banks 
or small business loans, um, mortgages, or in fact, credit cards, uh, the sort of basic, easily available credit, has tightened, is getting harder to find in a lot of places where it would be necessary as a, as a lubricant to keep business moving along. What's happening with credit, and has government intervention into the way credit has been granted uh, turning out to be uh, worse than the disease? We've been told that over the last years it's been too easy to get, and money's been too cheap, and it made people do bad things and make a lot of mistakes. Is this the answer? Uh, I, I don't know about that. I think the government for 50 years has subsidized housing and has decreed that, you know, owner-occupied housing is some magic bullet that serves multiple objectives. And I think that was a big driver in starting the financial meltdown was all the steps we took to try to get people to buy homes. And I think it it's not popular to say, but we'd just be better off if we had uh, jettison this idea that we should get the home ownership rate to one one hundred percent. That's a, a bad objective, and um, I fear that there, the Congress, especially, doesn't recognize any of that problem. And to the extent we're going to keep promulgating policies to push in that direction, I think it, it's going to be counterproductive. Um, that's not the central problem right now, but I think that's the biggest mistake government has made in the, the credit, uh, credit area for the last 10 years, was all these progressive um, policies were aimed at home ownership. In terms of what they're doing right now, I was walking over, I don't know if Fritz is still here, but one of our um, council members, Fritz Seegers, was walking over and he was telling me about some of the calculations they've made about how these disclosure costs are going to impair fees for the credit card issuers, which no doubt are going to hurt the bank's earnings. I think in, in lots of cases it's warranted to say that you ought to be able to understand the product you're getting at the time and that the person selling it to you ought not to be able to design the disclosure that's mailed to you three days after you've taken out the card and used it a couple of times. And I mean, there were definitely abuses there. So. The, the trick is going to be to find middle ground on some of this stuff. Um, it's, you know, most of the audience here is going to try to get a jumbo mortgage, probably, if you're going to try and get a mortgage. And the jumbo mortgage market is still impaired, which is a sign that the credit system still isn't, isn't working well. And I think we're at risk for declaring mission accomplished too early and leaving ourselves with kind of a walking wounded banking system that limps along, tries to earn its way out of this mess slowly, which it'll eventually do, but it'll be very expensive because there'll be, you know, some growth shaved off. So if we grow 1% a year less for two or three years, that's big stakes. And that, that's more or less what we're talking about. Well, help me understand the mechanics of this a little bit. If banks are turning down masters of the universe for, for jumbo loans, if they've got a strong Fair Isaac score, if they've got everything, no more liar loans, everything's been filled out in triplicate and Xerox many times, what does that tell you about the way we're lending money? If people who are, by any definition, a decent long-term risk are finding it hard to borrow money? It, it just tells you that the lenders are still impaired. They don't there, there's little incentive if you're running a bank to dilute your existing shareholders be, by recognizing the losses that, you would, that you've got embedded in your portfolio. So you, you roll the dice, you just say, look, I'm going to try to limp along. I'm not going to take any more risk because it could turn out bad. And the result is, in order to have a loan be profitable, it's got to be at a very, very attractive spread. And so you know, you get these, these spreads that look anomalous by historical standards that are an indication that the system is, is still not right. And I think we live at risk for limping through this for some time. And, um, you know, the answer is going to be, you know, force the banks to probably raise more money and preferably have a resolution procedure so that if someone, you know, city back Citibank comes to the trough for the fourth or maybe fifth time, at some point you say, we're going to break you up. 
and we don't have the bankruptcy authority to do that right now, so it's kind of hard when you don't have a stick to just keep handing carrots and hope things are going to get better, but that's where, we're, that's where we are right now. Uh, Steve Kaplan, I said I would come back to executive compensation, and so I shall, <laughs> because this has been fascinating to me. I, I will admit up front that I don't know everything there is to know about this world, so don't be mad at me, but um, from the outside looking in, it looks like all these marvelous institutions of uh, postgraduate education, the Kellogg's, the Whartons, the Booths, are churning out new cohorts of exquisitely educated business professionals who have really learned their stuff. And schools in other places around the world are churning out similar new and huge classes of exquisitely trained professionals. So in this world where there are more people who know how to do this stuff than ever, unlike in other labor markets where more people knowing how to do something bids down the rate of wages, I'm to understand that, in fact, in this world, that never happens uh, because there's something different and wonderful and anomalous about this world. Explain to me why compensation committees and search agencies don't go looking for the most competent, cheapest CEO when so, they go and do the search. So here's, I mean, that's a really good question, and the answer is very complicated, but I think what, what you have seen over the last 25, 30 years is a huge increase in scale in the economy and a huge improvement in technology. And that has created a lot of opportunity. And our students, you know, I'm happy to say, and I'm happy for many of you, uh, have taken advantage of that. And because of the opportunity, part of it is globalization, part of it is technology, they get paid a lot. Now, let's, let's take your CEO, but it's not quite so bad as, as you think. The CEOs, for example, CEOs of S&P 500 companies, do you know their pay has decreased since 2000? Most people would not would not know that, but the, uh, the, the are, average, are the average pay, pay or their, total compensation? their total compensation, the average total compensation of an S&P 500 CEO peaked in 2000, and the median has been flat, the average actually came down. So there has been some competition on that level, but people still get upset, you know, and, and, or get concerned because the, that typical CEO, the median CEO, makes about $8 million. Is that because the share price has been flat for eight years? It, it moves with the share price, which is another <laughs> point about, it's another point about um, compensation and inequality. Inequality is actually going to go down. It's going to go down significantly this year and next year because the stock market has gone down. It's just, it's, it's a natural, uh, you know, the, the two of them go hand in hand, and that's part of the scale, the scale piece. So let's come back to the CEO. The, the typical CEO makes $8 million. That's the median pay for an S&P 500 CEO. He or she has 20,000 employees. Um, that's a lot of money, $8 million. Put 20,000 employees is a lot of employees. He or she is, is in your sites every day, you know, waiting for you to find that he or she's made a mistake. It's a really tough job. CEO tenure has gone down from 10 years in the 70s to six years today, so it's a much riskier job. And they're, they're competing with, you know, I think you might have noticed the disclosure forms that the Obama administration employees filled out. Larry Summers made $8 million last year, working part-time. Um, there were two lawyers, law partners, Eric Holder, our attorney general, and uh, I think the assistant for national security who made between three and four million dollars uh, as lawyers last year. Now, I don't think they won every case. Might, you know, they might have, you know, they might have won half, you know, one of They're probably above 500 no, though. No, <laughs> nobody's, nobody's complaining about what they earn. So I think that the, you've got this phenomenon where because of scale, because of technological change, and you've seen this big increase in pay at the very top. I mean, this isn't the top 10% that Kevin's talking about. We're talking about the top half a percent or top 0.1%, which, you know, we train. I mean, that's, that's it's a great thing to be able to do. It's a privileged thing, and it's, it's you know, it does have some, um, you know, it does create some confusion and, and resentment. 
in the general population, but I think the most of it is caused by scale and technology, and that has that has had great effects as Gary started us off with the world economy and with fewer people in poverty, you know everything uh, we talked about, but it you know it has some negative perception effects, and that those are real. I will say again. There is some sense in which it self-corrects. So this decline, if you look at how pay of CEOs moves, if you look at how inequality moves, is very tied to the stock market. So with the stock market down 40%, inequality, when it starts getting measured, and it gets measured with about a two-year lag, inequality is going to come down. And you're going to be talking about two years from now, why has inequality come down? How come this varies so much from? <laughs> how come this varies so much from company, uh, country to country? Because you can look at some of the export champs of the world yeah. in East Asia, in Western Europe, very well run companies that return tremendous value to their shareholders, and their CEOs make a sizable multiple of what a per typical production worker for that company makes but not the many hundreds of times multiple yeah. that in the United States has become quite common. So, so Why is that? So, the, the, so two, two responses. First of all, if you look at the, the Forbes list of billionaires from uh, a year ago before we had this downturn, there has been a huge increase in billionaires all over the world. So we're talking about this is the scale argument that the income inequality or wealth inequality if you look at that around the world, it has to have gone up because some of the big beneficiaries are in India or China, uh, wherever. And so there are people there getting very wealthy, and they're the entrepreneurs and, to some extent, the financiers, which is actually true here. The big wealth is the entrepreneurs and uh, the hedge fund private equity uh, investors. So now coming back to the, the CEOs, um, the CEOs in the UK, you know, very close to us. CEOs well, and companies. That Anglo-Saxon model again. Yeah, but, but CEOs and companies that have to compete with us. So going back to the competition, are paid pretty well. And if they're not, a lot of those people move. I think what you'll find in Europe, for example, where do the best CEOs go? They're constrained by people like Mary Ann and the public companies. Uh, <laughs> but but you know, so where do they go? They go. They go to the private equity funded companies, and you'll see that. Private equity is actually, I think, was a somewhat larger business in... <laughs> Are they constrained so like here? Like you? I, 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 I've done nothing. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they just, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what drives CEO pay, but I mean, there's a few things that Steve said, which, you know, obviously the, the, the story that Steve is saying is, is, I think, has been a very, very popular, and I think, kind of... Um, story, which is just about allocation of talent, and you know we are living in a world where companies are getting bigger, and CEOs are becoming captains of bigger and bigger ship, and it really matters, especially now, to just match the best talent to these bigger companies because uh, these guys become so important. I, I think people that have looked at this carefully, though, it, it just historically doesn't match. I mean, you know, there's been periods of very strong growth in company size, you know, 30s, 40s, I mean, I'm getting the, the decades wrong, where well, there, was, there was no, you know, no change in CO pay. So it's just, just, I mean, I'm not going to go into details, but I mean, I think if, if you look the at the, 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 what drive that story about scale, it, it just, at least the historical data just doesn't, uh, the tech, doesn't match. The I mean, I think when you different. think about, I mean, I, I think I about... disagree with that. Okay. In the U.S.? Uh, in the U.S.? In the U.S., yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the big puzzle is the international comparison. Like, Toyota's head gets a lot less Again, so people have managed to put, like, 100 years of data on CEO pay for, like, admittedly a small numbers of companies, but the patterns in terms of, like, size and growth of pay just don't... But Mary, uh, Mary don't, Ann, don't your story, anywhere. if you had us stay the, the way the 40s to the 70s were, a CEO today would make $800,000 instead of $8 million, And you know what? You'd have nobody any good running an S&P 500 no, company. Now, wait, wait a minute. No, I think, I think that, that's Japanese. where you lost me. I, I was with you all the way until the, then you wouldn't have anybody any good to run the company. I just, I just don't believe... Look, look, I, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, Steve, just, just to uh, disagree with you there, I mean, my, my, my sense is... is uh, I, I, uh, departing a little from Chicago tradition, I, I'm not sure a lot of CEOs get the greatest benefit from the pay. 
uh, a lot of them get their benefit from the status, the position, uh, the power, the, to some extent the perks. But I think there are lots of other things that go into this. So just to depart from the, you wouldn't find anybody good. I think you I, would. I, I, I would. I would. I would be happy to take a vote of the it's people here yeah. and see and see who was. Uh, it's a we, we can we get a it's vote. On the yeah, let me Steve, let me let's, let's let's Gary, let Gary let Gary let Gary. No, it's the competition. An American CEO or the, may, the, may, somebody from Toyota. It, it's the competition argument that it's Gary Gary is friend. That's why you wouldn't find it because the best people would get. Yeah. And the globalization the has made some of that international. The problem, is, the, problem, the problem, Steve, I think, at the core of this, I mean, like, again, I, I totally understand the argument, but like, wh how are these best people identified? As, as economists, we spend our life, I mean, I've spent many years kind of trying to study this and try to say, how do I figure out where talent is? Why do you figure out this guy is adding value, this guy is not adding value? It's, I don't think anyone has managed to do that so far. So how can we believe that, like, you know, where, that where's that, that process? How, how is that process, this, this how is that process how happening? Do, That's how, what do, I, how do we know how to hire you? I mean, no, come on, no. we, can, we can pick out talent. I, I think you're missing no, two Steve. important problems. Yeah. Gary Becker. And Marianne, I, yeah. and Steve, maybe. <laughs> I think you're missing two important problems. One, I don't know if the CEOs are getting what they deserve. I mean, but I don't think we make that decision. I, am I getting what I deserve? It, uh, is ragu? I mean, the markets determine that. Now, you say the market isn't working well. Are, are we going to have the government determining these right. decisions? So I, I'm not no, going to say that. I mean, I've been bothered at times by these high pays for some people in the financial community. It's bothered me. But to say that I, I feel that we have a mechanism for changing Gary, that. Gary, I, I certainly I don't, don't believe the government should be setting All right, but then, I'm certainly but, not saying but then, that. Then, I mean, then but, another but, point, but then what would you have? Because people you know, the, the American economists perform well. We have better well. rules in terms of like who can appoint the members of like yeah, the compensation these, committee at companies. Say we have rules that say the CEO does not appoint the, the members of the compensation committee. Is that, you know, I'm not saying the government decides with the CEO. Maybe we should. Maybe we should, but it wouldn't make a great deal of difference in the, what, in the performance. What, what's the it doesn't really mean much for profitability of the company, mm -hmm. so no. you cut their salaries down. Well, if it will, let's, you know. And, and so, I mean, I don't know what, what you, you know, maybe the compensation is more accurate. Okay, what, what, what's the evidence that the Japanese export firms that have creamed many of the manufacturing firms in the U.S., Whose, whose companies would be uh, Fortune 50 or 100 here, who are paid, you know, a quarter, would be worse. I just think there are some things that we don't understand well. The Japanese don't pay their CEOs so well. Those companies don't suffer. They often kick, kick the butts of everybody else in the world. It's not so simple. What well, they pay the Nissan but, guy but, they, but who they brought in. Less, but that was a turnaround case, but the, uh, <laughs> but Honda and Toyota. They, and they, and yeah, I know. It's a, it's a different culture, and they don't, there's no market there. They don't move exactly. around. Exactly. That's, that's the difference. And you know, I, this is, So this it must is, be the mediocre a, guys that won cheap, out? This is a cheap no. shot, but that's maybe why they have the kink they have. No, but, no. but uh, uh, Honda and Toyota. Okay, that's your story. If you're reduced to saying Honda and Toyota I said the are the entire, top, the entire good luck. country. But Anil, Anil, I, I think you missed it. The point is that that was the market outcome in Japan, though, right? I mean, we're not saying. What are you saying? We should limit salaries in no, the U.S. I'm to just what saying it's not self-evident that Maybe we should, if the pay is lower, you're going to get basket cases running companies. Oh no, but, but you can't use the Japanese example to counter that argument. Because there's no market. Because you're, so you're going to cross these markets. You're not saying, what would happen within the market if I paid less? I mean, you know, if I, within a market, your houses are more expensive in New York than they are in Kansas. I just said but it was it mean, complicated. I just, Steve has it is, it is purports so a the, theorem. It is. So the chairman of Nokia is probably making less than Bernie Ebers was making as the chairman of WorldCom. <laughs> and did they just go find some Finnish schmo to be the chairman of, of Nokia? No, they probably no, have no, one they, of the best they, guys they, in Finland. Well, but, There's but, only one Nokia, though. That's, <laughs> but see, that's the point. They found, they found the best guy in Finland, but... You gotta pay. The, you, you, you gotta pay the top. If you want the top people within a system, you gotta pay to get them. You gotta go with what the market is. And if you say I'm gonna lower CEO pay and I'm gonna keep the pay where it is in the rest of the economy, those people are gonna leave. Maybe the answer is we let more guys immigrate from Japan and become CEOs in the U.S. Create more competition for guys at the top. But, but you can't, but I, Kevin, Kevin, there's an intermediate position, right, which is saying that 
We still let COP be de determined by the, by the board, but we feel there are problems with the board. I that a board which goes around and says, I want to pay my CEO at, 75, at the 75th percentile, and if every board does this, you're going to get but pay inflation right, over time. That is, a complete red no, no. that is a complete red herring. No, no, it's not. Your pay has gone down. It's gone down no. in the last eight years because, over the period that's where because stock prices have, have gone down. Oh, that's, that's, because no, that's, that's because not, stock prices not, have gone that's down. That's not true. No, no, but, but the real that's issue. That's not true. Steve, Steve, the real issue is you cannot establish, neither can I, that pay is either too high or too low. We don't know what the level of pay should be. Yeah. What we can talk about is whether corporate governance practices were adequate or not. And, and, and this is where Marianne has actually done some work. And, where, as, as have I. As and you we, have. And we disagree. <laughs> <laughs> And the rest of us I are mean, in this country. There's a disagreement. I mean, and there, you know, kind of, I think Steve would agree that, yeah, you can, uh, you know, isolate some basket cases where, you know, um, there are excess, and, but it's a few exceptions, right? Yeah, that would be, that that would be, be your answer to this work. Right. No, I, I, I kind of never thought I had a good answer to this. I mean, I thought there was one bit of research that kind of got me to change my mind about that, you know, that these are just a few exceptions. So I was reading the research on the backdating scandals. You remember the backdating scandals, kind of these kind of stock options that kind of were kind of given, and then they chose, like, the point at which the stock price was the lowest and decided that was the point at which they were actually given. So, so some guys have actually worked on this and figured out about 30% of farms, you know, kind of engage in, the, of, of the largest particular firm engage in that activity. So that seems to be more than just, you know, than just a few isolated cases where governance but, might be, but, might be but, a problem. Take another on, example again, which is in front of us, it's right? It's on the margin. But, it's no, on no, the no, margin. Steve, the not margin. Margin. on the margin. It's on the margin. Front and center in terms of breakdown of corporate governance is the financial sector. You so cannot we, close your we, eyes to we, what happened. And there's where we disagree. Now, let me, let me tell you the story. On the executive pay side, no. the pe wait, wait a second. There's, there's two parts. I would say ma there was bad management. There was clearly bad management. Was this caused by the boards? Look at Jimmy Kane at Bear Stearns. He lost a billion dollars. He lost a billion dollars. Look at Dick Fold. These guys lost hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. So it wasn't the pay. They didn't have bad incentives. They just got it wrong down in the oh, organization. It was bad management. They would, they would, so I'm a, I'm, I agree with you to some you extent on mistakes. the pay, but I find the board, the main board problem is not getting rid of the incompetent CEOs. I mean, it's true at all organizations. It's true at universities. Turn, turnover, it's, it's, true it's at not perfect, but turnover has gone it, from 10 I know, years you said to it's gone down. Years, it's, but I, I look at GM, I look at some other companies. That's true. It's been pretty well accepted, didn't have good leadership, and these guys stayed on for a long time. Not only talking about the last people, but also previous uh, CEOs. Uh, so I've always it's, found the big problem with boards is Yes, maybe pay is a problem, but they don't kick out the guys who aren't performing well fast enough. Ab absolutely. There's no question they're not perfect. But, but the, the question is, there are two questions. First of all, are they broken? And I think by no means are they broken. And then second of all, what's your alternative? That's, that's the real question. And, and I don't know I that agree. there is a better one. Kevin, go okay, ahead. I just think, I mean, I think what you're saying is, and I think what everybody's saying is that Maybe high CEO pay is a symptom of an underlying problem. It's not in and of itself the problem. I think if you came in and pushed down pay, it would create its own set of problems yes. that I think governance issues need to be addressed, and, but it's not CEO pay per se. It's a symptom and probably not even the worst symptom. It's these other things like not getting rid of guys who lose it's not that we paid him eight million; it's that he lost eight billion. Is the real problem, right? I mean, you know, I can tolerate the eight million. I'd pay him for the rest of his life if he would stop losing me. Thirty billion in one year. You know, got rid of thirty billion in their assets in one year. Yeah, well, it was real money. <laughs> well, I'm talking real money. You, know. you give me a better system. That's all. It's, it's yeah, my no. response, and it's the market. You know, the mar easy. markets operate it's here the way easy. they operate in other places, and it's just hard to argue that that they're. Well, not well an interesting operating. thing, though, is do we think you know pay has obviously gone up in the U.S. over time, but do we think corporate governance has gotten worse, or it's do you think better. it's gotten better? It's gotten yeah. Better. I think that in well, but, but I guess the answer to that has been, the, I mean, the, the, the stock options have made a big difference, right? I mean, I think the people that have looked at the, the time series and tried to reconcile exactly that. The governance seems to have gotten better, maybe, and then pay is going but, up. But, I mean, but, lots well, of people have discussed the stock options that they were not understood by the boards, that the board had no strong intention to pay attention to them because they were actually not reflected in accounting numbers, and that was a big part. Plus, the government, actually, by putting this cap on the salary compensation that yeah. could actually be uh, tax deductible, that, that all really fueled the, but, the, the stock. 
it worse. Wait, 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 uh, and the, the real it, question is, did. no, has it gotten better I enough? So. That, that has it gotten Look, enough the better pay, the, to account for these larger firms that can make tremendous pay. mistakes? You know, the pay, the, if you look at the share of the CEOs in the top 1% of the income distribution, it's gone down. So again, the, 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 the pay and governance, what's happened with the CEOs is actually no different, or in fact is muted, relative to what's happened with the rest of the economy, going back to the market-oriented. Market forces operate, and they're not perfect, and mistakes are made, but again, it's a market phenomenon rather than some phenomenon where the boards are messing up, or you know, systematically, or there's this huge systemic problem. It's markets. Well, where a good point, Steve, is it? One can talk about corporate government, but it's hard to think of what you can implement that's going to make it a lot better. And I think that's that's an important. Past point. practices not clear. We even went in the right direction, yeah. limiting directly pay. Right. It wasn't clear a great solution to this problem. I, I, I mean, agree with that. It, I think no one, no one here seems to agree with that. And that cuts across all these things. Is that you can always think of things that could be done to make the system better, but is that would what would be done if we decided to intervene? And but again, we, we come back to uh, sort of what I, the smoke bomb that I threw out there in the middle to get this, <laughs> this going in the first place, which is that as workers, all kinds of workers in the United States have been told that their wages are not going up this year or next year, and they didn't go up the year before that. And basically, um, wages for tens of millions of workers corrected for inflation haven't gone up that much since the 1970s because there are now worldwide labor markets for the kind of work that they do. So we tell tens of millions of American workers that that's the reason why their wages are not going up while, uh, you know, uh, Ken, uh, Kozlowski has, um, has Michelangelo's David peeing vodka uh, from a, from a, in a fountain with company money. Uh, yes, quickly, and then we got to close this up. Okay, one, <laughs> and, and, one and of the things is, is... I'm sorry about that uh, one graphic of the things, example. One of the things I don't wanna, we don't want to forget, though, is that the workers have also benefited a lot from globalization. I mean, yeah. the availability of very inexpensive goods coming from abroad it has probably benefited the lower income people at least as much as it has the higher income people in the United States. More uh, you know, not, go to, not, you, not to mention all over the world. Oh yeah, you, you, know, you, you know, you go to Walmart, you go to Target, and you see that you can buy goods at nominal prices that are below where they were when I was a kid. That's amazing in a world in which we think inflation has been over 300 percent since then. It's really quite striking. We are just about at the end of our time uh, for this panel, so I want to go quickly across the six of you and get some quick impressions on, uh, we, we've done a lot of talking about uh, the state of the problem. Let's, let's close with some suggested um, solutions. How do we apply the ideas that you've been talking about over the last hour and 45 minutes um, to moving forward? Uh, should governments uh, be involved in an emergency situation, or in general, with the regulation of the economy. And we'll start with Anil and come back around yeah. to Gary. Um, I think you, you, you want to do it on a case-by-case -case basis. I, I think uh, some of the interventions in the financial system prevented things from getting much, much worse. So I don't want to say that those were blanket mistakes. But I think the exit strategies need to be thought through, and we need to have some principles. And the thing that I'm most worried about for our interventions, let's say, in the financial system, is that the political pressure to stay in is going to be astronomical. And um, if it's Ben Bernanke and the technocrats deciding how these pro um, programs are going to end, I see that as not such a big problem. If it's the Congress that went and lobbied for particular banks to get TARP money when they wouldn't have otherwise qualified. I assume those same forces are going to have them intervening to 
achieve lots of other goals. And I think that's the, the very difficult um, problem. I mean, the financial system had a lot of, a lot of self-inflicted problems. The government's now intervened in there, and trying to bound the intervention is, is going to be hard. And I, I think it's going to be, it's way too early to tell whether it's, it's going to net-net have been a, a, a good thing or just an okay thing. I think avoiding a, another month like we had in October and November was worth a lot, but if we get the kink in the growth rate, we're going to give it all back. Marianne? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I kind of question whether should, should the government intervene. I, again, I, I, I don't know. My, my view is that, you know, we, we, have, we have a system here where, you know, there are very little safety nets that are kind of built into the system, which has great positive implications, as we've discussed, in terms of, in terms of growth. But that also means that we reach kind of extreme situations like the one that we have. Maybe there is a need to actually, you know, intervene to cover the system because, you know, those, the, the, that, that kind of protection is not built into the system. More generally, I think, you know, uh, in terms of kind of the positive that could come out of, of all this, I, I think that this issue of, like, better consumer protection, better information disclosure, um, that more thoughts will be, you know, will be placed on, on improving that, I think, is important. Steve? Uh, <clears throat> clearly, I'm going to agree with Anil. You know, in the middle of the crisis, when the financial system froze at the end of September, yeah, the government had to do something. The system was frozen. We were, you know, in free fall, um, and uh, the government did. Uh, I think since then, the Fed has and Bernanke have been heroes. Uh, they have, you know, they went very quickly to low interest rates. Uh, they help part of the system. They guarantee the short-term debt of the banks. And even though the crisis is, is not over, we've still got trouble, they you know, stabilize the system, and the system is stabilized. Um, I want to agree with Raghu, we need to do better on health care and education. And it is the government's role to set the rules. I mean, it's not any of us wouldn't say we, we don't want government. That, that'd be crazy. Um, the, the real issue uh, is that you want to have market-oriented solutions rather than regulatory solutions. And what I see with the Obama administration and Congress uh, is a very redistribution-oriented, anti-growth, anti-market uh, kind of orientation. Uh, they're interpreting the anger that is out there, and it's very real that you mentioned, uh, as uh, a mandate to redistribute, and I think it is very troubling because I think I'm more optimistic in the short run than Anil because I think the Fed has done good things, but in the medium and longer run, you know, instead of a U, I'm looking at a fish hook because it's not going to get back to the U because of all these anti-growth, uh, anti-market type uh, policies. So I would say, you know, be careful about what you regulate, and again good regulations that use the markets uh, in a responsible way. Kevin? I, I guess I have three, three components to what I would say. First, I, I think, do think there's still more work to be done in the financial sector. That's where the problem really was located primarily to begin with. Uh, I, I think that I agree that I think the Fed is probably a better solution than the Treasury is, and I think it continues to be a potentially better solution in, in, in the near term. Uh, I think the biggest, I have one negative and one kind of don't and one do. I think that the don't is don't use this as cover to go off into other directions that really don't, weren't part of the crisis, weren't part of the problem. Focus on where the problems lie. You know, no need to overall antitrust enforcement in the United States under the guise of getting us out of this. No, no call for big labor market reforms as a way to get out of this. Uh, no call for, you know, moving into taking over private companies, GM, Chrysler, whatever else is down the road. On the positive side, I agree. I think we've all agreed that investment in education and investment in improving the system to help low-skilled uh, people that lack opportunity today, the caveat there is it's going to take a long time. That's not a quick fix. But that's not a reason to get, it's not a reason not to start. You gotta start even though it's not gonna solve tomorrow. If we had started 15, 20 years ago, we would have seen the benefits already. We gotta start today and it's gonna slowly free benefits. So try not to do harm, 
try not to expand the fiscal deficit any more than you have to and try to focus on doing the real things we need, education and health, to improve our, our the conditions for people across the board. Raghu? Well, uh, let me agree with that last point and not repeat it. Uh, I do think also that there is a, a global concern. We need to think about rebalancing demand. And, and the reason the world doesn't equilibrate is because there's a lot of government action preventing this rebalancing. And we need to think about how to, how to do that. That said, I, I, would, I would urge that we resist making the global worker a villain in the peace that it is not the workers in China and the workers in India who are keeping down wages here, and they're part of the solution, that if we keep markets open, they will provide the demand that will make all of us better, and it is in our interest to make sure that they go through the process that we have benefited from. And I would say one of the bigger casualties of the crisis, which was probably a response to your first question that I didn't answer, is the uh, the the the, the movement towards markets in these countries. As Gary said, there are already markets, they are being used, but the movement was in some sense driven by the kind of example that the U.S. set as, as, as the potential of what other countries could achieve. Now I hear when I go back to India, oh, we were ahead of the U.S., we nationalized our banks before the U.S. did it. Uh, so, um, so I think that's a problem, uh, and I think that's, 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 that's a difficulty in the longer run, and it would be damaging. Uh, on the financial sector itself, I think we are in danger of tackling the specifics of the problem, saying this is the subprime crisis, and we'll stamp out this. But this is a game of whack-a-mole. It'll rear its head somewhere else. It's no surprise that Citibank has found a different way of getting into trouble in the last uh, uh, th three decades. Three times it's been in trouble, each time different. First time it was uh, lending to emerging markets. Second time commercial real estate third time mortgage-backed securities. Let's try and focus on what's deep behind this rather than focusing on the symptoms and dealing with subprime mortgage back. So I think we need cleverer regulation. And I have to commend uh, Anil and, uh, and, and the IGM for working on this kind of thing, uh, trying to propose more out-of-the-box ways of thinking about it so that perhaps next time around we may actually get it right. Gary. Yeah, I have a few comments, um, although some of it will be repetitive. I think, on the, I, think, I think on the regulation side, we have to make sure that any regulations we implement operate more or less automatically, because the regulators failed in this case. There are a lot of things they didn't do that they could have done, and if you give a lot of discretion to the regulators, I think they'll get caught up in exactly the same sort of a mentality that the private sector gets caught up in. So that would be the first thing. Not discretion, but mainly rules-based regulation that kick in automatically. Secondly, as I, I started out with this comparison between two models of capitalism, what I call the French, I won't call it the Belgian one, <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> Marianne, uh, uh, but the continental in some sense, loose sense, and the Anglo-Saxon in another loose sense. I think the Anglo-Saxon model has had its defects, but it's performed pretty well over uh, long periods of time. I think it would be a shame if the United States and other countries, in their recognition of, of these serious difficulties we're in now, uh, greatly injured uh, that model. Uh, so I, uh, I mentioned a few examples. I won't, won't repeat them. The third one, I have to say, even though everybody more or less else has said it, um, I started writing about human capital <laughs> decades ago. Um, the human capital issue is even more important now <laughs> than it was at that time. Uh, it's a longer-term process because human capital is a long-term investment. Uh, but any long-term investment, you've got to start sometime. It'll, it'll produce its benefits in the future. And I think uh, we have a very strong human capital base in the U.S., but it, it has some serious defects. We've identified some of them in education and health. I think we got to put a lot of the resources in, a, in a, that area. That's it. And a final comment by Anil. No, I just, I, <laughs> this is a recession. There's lots of things you could be doing with your time. The faculty doesn't thank the alumni and especially the board that's given up a lot of their time the last two days. So just be aware the faculty appreciates all that many of you in this room do for the school. Thank you. So thank yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for a reporter, 
uh, the refreshing thing about this panel was that unlike where I work in Washington, where people revert back to their talking points with a, th a sort of theological fervor, but, it, but have it totally unrooted in data, observation, actual observable fact, <laughs> it is um, refreshing uh, to be with scholars who uh, base the way they see the world on things that can be measured, touch, touched, felt, seen, and offer some basis of proof for the things that uh, are the beliefs that drive their scholarship. So it's, it's been a real joy for me, and thank you for the privilege of being with you and with you today. Thank you. All right, thank you. First of all, Ray Suarez. Did you have fun trying to guide this panel? A little harder than maybe some other panels. I'll just say welcome back to the University of Chicago. That's right. Uh, and the best faculty in the world. I wanted to thank the 1,200 people here. Uh, yeah, the best faculty in the world. I also wanted to uh, say thanks to our gatherings at our London campus, our gatherings in Hyde Park, and to the, we got a number, we had 4,100 people online. So uh, for those of you who have comments, I think we have comment cards. For those of you who are online, we have ways of posting questions. I will not answer all the questions. I think we'll try to figure out how to pose a few questions back to uh, the panel. Um, a couple final thoughts from me. Markets, market-oriented economies are going to continue. Uh, governments are going to play a bigger role. I think those are the two big ones. The other big one for me is, uh, and Gary mentioned it, um, it may be surprising to people outside the University of Chicago and those not familiar with the University of Chicago how much this discussion focused on human capital. But this is the University of Chicago, and this is where the understanding of human capital in the modern economy really began and developed. I mean, Gary was a little bit modest about this. He literally wrote the book titled Human Capital. So it is the most important type of human capital, uh, excuse me, form of capital in the modern economy. It's more important, we believe, than financial capital or physical capital. And that's why we spend so much time on it. And in terms of the work done by everybody here, we understand that it's got market-oriented economies have to work for people. That's why this issue of income distribution and political support for outcomes is so important. I think the other thing is we didn't get into global trade as much as maybe we would want, but I think the story of human history is greater integration uh, I don't think that's uh, going to change greater complexity, and that's what this gathering is all about. We greatly appreciate your contributions, as Anil said, to the school. We will get together at Gleacher at 3.30, so we have a little time. Again, thank you, Ray. Thank you, panel. Thank all of you.